Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode, really fun one for me, um, because we had kind of an OG on um, today's podcast, James Barton. And James is currently the head of global sales development at Venify, but that may not be telling the full picture. The full picture is James actually has almost two decades worth of experience in the sales development game and a decade and a half as a sales development leader. In fact, you're going to recognize a ton of the companies where he's led the sales development programs at, including Vonage, Vizier, On24, Mixpanel. And then we spent a lot of time talking about his kind of like start to running SDR teams over at Success Factors, now owned by SAP. What you'll really hear coming across in this interview is not only James's ample wisdom and experience with running uh, sales development programs, but really a, a, a great human and, a, and like tons of like life lessons and, and the kind of leader that I am not surprised in the least that teams want to run through the wall and perform and are constantly motivated by. Um, you'll hear that coming across loud and clear. Uh, in fact, this is a very inspirational episode as far as I'm concerned, because I agree with virtually all of James's takes um, on motivation, on kind of team construction, on mindset. And he goes deep into kind of like some of the stories, some of the uh, foundational concepts uh, that he's used to deliver success over and over and over and over again um, throughout his career. So without further ado, I'm not going to spoil any of the, the really good nuggets um, that you're going to take away from this episode. Here's James Barton. All right. And we're back with James Barton. And, and James, you know, one of the things that's exciting for me about having you as a guest on the Enterprise Sales Development Podcast here is that you have got a legit, you know, decade and a half of experience in and around sales development, have seen so much. Why don't you, why don't we start this discussion by kind of like walking through your first SDR experience? Sounds great. And, and first off, Eric, thanks so much for, for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Um, my, my, my story of becoming an SDR, getting into the SDR world is kind of an interesting bumped and bruised kind of path. Um, I graduated from the University of Michigan in 2000 and uh, immediately came home. I was sick of the flat, cold weather, you know, the Midwest. And uh, my dad was from there, but I knew I wanted to get out. Coming back to San Francisco, you couldn't buy a job. So I kind of bumped around the first six years out of college trying to figure out what to do. Uh, you know, I was development at a hotel. I was uh, a video game tester for George Lucas. I uh, worked even in direct marketing, which was rough doing catalog management. Uh, and then I, I was talking to friends from high school, and one of them uh, somehow secured this job working for this startup called Success Factors. And he's like, I can get you an interview. I'm like, I don't even know what the hell this is or, you know, <laughs> HR tech? What the heck is that? Um, went into the interview, and I, in the moment I got there, I got the job, and was, I was jumping for joy. Um, I was commuting down from the northern part of San Francisco all the way down to Silicon Valley five days a week, and I didn't care. So I, I had a great job that I loved. Kind of talk about duck to water. And um, I got in at a really interesting time because HR tech was taken off, and you know th these antiquated models of sales development have always been in place, but they were never really created by people who had either done the job or had even done the job in the past 10 years yeah. because it was still in that infancy stages of when SDR was a formal role separating out from the closing side. So I was in it for about a year and a half. Um, and the model was just basically like, you find a new deal and that's it. That's what you're comped on. But I recognized really early on, the closer that I partnered with my sales reps in the field, the more I understood their process, the more I could, you know, deliver what they really truly needed. But the one thing that kind of revealed itself was relationships. Yeah. And that's truly the role of a sales development rep is find new relationships, nurture them, deliver them, support them, 
And it's not just a, okay, I'm out of here, you know, kind of thing. It's like, you are the name, the voice, the first point of contact that any of these people have in their experience with your company. So it was a, an amazing ride to get there, coming out with a fine arts degree, you know, I haven't done anything with it really much since, since leaving college, but yeah, you know, I, I talk about, I hit the ground running and never looked back. Well, and you were at Success Factors too for almost eight years. So really through kind of a very interesting time from tech recession um, all the way up through another like global recession, if you will. Even, even before that, I got there pre-IPO and we IPO'd about a year after I got there. And then everything just went straight downhill and, you know, end of 2000, 2008. 2007, 2008. Yeah. Um, even continued in the beginning of 2009. But yeah, it was it was a roller coaster, but it was amazing. Amazing. Well, you know, you used a, a word that I think should be top of mind, should be first and prioritized across all SDRs that, that perform the craft. And that word is relationships. Mm-hmm. But I fear that it's not. Would you agree? 100%. 100%. The, um, the scary thing is like back when I was an SDR, I was introduced, here's your phone, here's a computer, good luck. And it's like, uh, okay. There was no outreach. There was no sales off. There was no LinkedIn sales navigator. I mean, it was just Salesforce and that was it. I had to create word documents of my own templates. Um, enablement was basically bootcamp, which is nine times out of 10 oriented only for sales reps. Yeah. So you're, you're coming into it kind of blind and the experience stunk as a new hire, but looking back, it was probably a really great, you know, lesson. It was like one of those, my uncle didn't do this, but those uncles that pushed the kid in the pool that guess what you're swimming, right? It was yeah. kind of like thrown in the deep end and it was great because you build your own process and your own pathway. But yeah, I, I, Fast forward, I went into sales for a year in 2008, but I came back because I, you know, everybody was doing layoffs, and I was lucky enough to get a job back on the SDR team. And 2009 was a really eye-opening life experience, let alone professional experience, where you know I was calling heads of HR immediately after they were laying off 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people in one day. Yeah. And I'll never, never forget this one woman. I was like, hi, I'm James from Success Factors. Did I catch it at a bad time? And you could hear the tears. Oh, so bad. And she told me how she'd lay off like 15,000 people like an hour beforehand. And I'm like, do you want to talk? And it was just this 45 minute session of her talking to me. And she's like, oh, why'd you call? <laughs> But it was it was great because I was able to create this relationship and I figured, you know, that, that year in sales that you shouldn't ever have a square peg round hole. You shouldn't have either when you're creating these relationships. You should start listening to the person you're talking to because SDRs today, back to the original point of, you know, creating relationships, they hide behind technology. Yeah. Sales is an art form and so is sales development. And, and yeah, there are metrics, there are numbers. There's a, I like to say sales development is a pipeline and revenue uh, predictability engine. Mm-hmm. Um, and probably the most predictable aspect of that whole you know, life cycle from top to the bottom of the funnel. But it starts with relationships and setting the experience off on a good foot with the prospect or customer. And then being joined at the hip with all of your partners, whether it be your sales reps or marketing, sales operations. So everybody's kind of in sync on the same sort of wavelength, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I think that <clears throat> relationships are tricky too, because you, you're starting in, the, in an awkward way. I think we can all agree that, you know, SDR, the role is interruptive. It's, um, you know, we're bringing the conversation to the prospect rather than the other way around. So I think one of the big hurdles for a lot of SDRs is just getting over that kind of like fear, getting over that mm-hmm. kind of, <clears throat> I've never done their job. I don't, th- this is impossible. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know what a head of HR does all day. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and yet I'm calling into them every single day. Yeah. And that's what what was really interesting about having that be my first stop in tech is that HR 
is all people. It's all process combined with relationships. Yep. And never in the history of mankind has human resources ever created a single dollar of revenue. So they're the most, like the largest, the most, you know, black hole succubus of, of, of internal budget right. you'll ever find in a company. So you're the trying to sell your- of cost centers. <laughs> yes. It's like anywhere from 80 to 95% of the annual budget of a company. Yeah. So how do you sell to a company that can't actually produce any value back monetarily to a company? And that's a whole different ballgame because you got to create a relationship, but then also educate them on how this can make their lives better. Back to the story of the woman that I caught crying. I'm like, if I could take 15 minutes at a better time, when it's a better day, and show you how you would probably never have to go through that experience ever again, would it be worth it? She goes, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> there you go. So that's how I got in the door, right? Yeah, that's the warmest yeah. of warm leads too. Yeah. That you pass down to the sales team and, and they're forever thankful. And so, you know, you started in HR tech, but then you, you've broadened and, and had a number of leadership roles, sales development wise. <clears throat> and I'd love right. to kind of get those kind of like threaded together, because then I'd like to talk a little bit about how you run your programs, because I think that's where there's a ton of insights to be had. Yeah. So, you know, after... <laughs> After success factors, um, you know, you were at Symphony. I mean, IOSD. IOSD. Yeah. That's a branding yeah. challenge right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then more familiar firms like Mixpanel, On24, um, Vizier, uh, and, and your current role now, fast forward to Venify. So, mm -hmm. and all in the kind of like sales development leadership role. Talk to me a little bit about the threads of commonality and the string there for you on that career arc. Yeah. So I, I got into sales development leadership in 2010, uh, a year after I came back to the SDR team at Success Factors. Soon after recognizing that nobody really was an advocate of the SDR team or the function beyond the borders of the SDR managers. And at that time, there was no career path in sales development. Right. Maybe you're lucky to find the, that rare unicorn role of a sales development director or departmental leader kind of thing. But for the most part, there was no path. It's a stepping stone. It's a, oh, well, nobody wants to be a sales developer if they're in general life, right? Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, I make the joke, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but I, I love what I do because of the value, because of the predictability engine aspect of what we do. And it goes back to relationship building is not just with, you know, beyond the borders of the company. It's also within the company too. It's the, you know, being able to be that person to help ask the question or ask something of the team, but also justify the why. And why is this being asked of SDRs? And why are we going to make your head spin asking 45 different things every day kind of thing? And, but also always being an advocate for the individual team member, creating that relationship, building that trust, but also knowing, having your team members know that their best interest is priority number one. In a lot of ways, I, I have a lot of friends in the, the bar and restaurant industry, and we make the joke that I'm more of a chef than any of them because chef always eats last, yeah. takes care of everybody else than themselves, sometimes not at all. So, um, is there a science back to, book similar to that about eating last, leaders eat last or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I read the book too, and I'm like, yeah, this is all my friends back to the bar and restaurant industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, so I, I just kind of one step at a time, um, I, I kind of settled into it, but it all started back in 2009 where my chief operations officer and my SDR manager, who was my biggest competitor the first time I was in SDR, came to me asking to help them reinvent the sales development model. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, I'm just an SDR, right? <laughs> They're like, no, we want to re actually recreate the entire model based upon what you're doing the first time. And I'm like, just creating new relationships. And they're basically a, yeah. So we figured out if you incentivize and you measure on the right activities, which turn the right behaviors, which turn to the right results, you can bring that forecastability of the SDR team back to like the initial stages of what we're doing. 
So before that, the company couldn't predict before the last stage in a sales cycle. We had no idea how many meetings it took to get a, a sales cycle rolling, let alone find a deal to advance it to close. Um, you know, in luckily, luckily enough, you know, it wasn't me, it was the team. I don't take any credit for it, but the team yeah. showed if we have that kind of incentivizing the right behaviors along the way to produce the right results to our internal customers. Not only it sped up sales cycles by 10 to 15% ish, and it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the dollar amount also went up too, because those initial stages velocity sped up faster, but also we were creating those relationships that kept lasting beyond the initial stage. And we could keep coming back like, oh, did you happen to know about this other product we had to offer too? That's really complimentary to what we were talking about last time. Oh, really? All of a sudden those deals got a lot larger. All right. of a sudden there's more people coming in from different departments. All of a sudden, we're incentivizing creating relationships in those must-have departments like finance, procurement, et cetera, that sales reps were basically by themselves trying to find in late stages in our sales cycle. So, but I know it's a long tangent, but that was kind of like where it all launched from. So then beyond that, I took that as my foundation of every, every company I've been at is make sure that one, SDRs have a voice, two, the relationship base, especially in the enterprise world. But also take those right behaviors, incentivize them that are the leading indicator of those success metrics of opportunities of pipeline and ultimately revenue. When you say right behaviors, just so we put a, a fine point on it um, for the listeners, what are those behaviors that you're prioritizing or even that, that you've prioritized in the groups that you run? Number one priority is new relationships. That's ultimately why sales development was separated out from the closing side is to find new relationships sales reps wouldn't be able to or didn't have time to go on down. Yep. So that that is one of the KPIs that I always like to incentivize on, especially in the enterprise mid-market space uh, in my my path. Uh, but it's also understanding everything, all this leading indicators that come up to that because we're so, you know, operationally kind of in this structure of ratios of phone calls, emails, LinkedIn messages to conversations, to meetings set, meetings that take place, additional meetings that need to happen, more meetings turn into opportunities, more meetings that help advance those opportunities, the pipeline. So it's it's anything and everything that you can capture to create that kind of golden ratio, as I call it. Mm -hmm. It's always a moving target, depending upon the person, the region, the team, et cetera. Time of the year is even a factor seasonality. Sure. But meetings that take place is what I like to compensate on the front, front side of it. And then new sales cycles that are discovered and converted or AKA accepted by our sales counterparts is what I really like to also compensate upon. And how much control do you like to place into the hands of the SDR at what, where their patch, what their segment, how they can control what new relationships they're, they're targeting? Sure. Um, it, it all depends. So let, let's say I'm, I'm running a team and that's, I, we only focus on enterprise and top end of enterprise for a benefit today. But let's say I've got an enterprise team and a mid-market team. Typically, I'll look at team members coming in uh, or have had time in the role internally. They can have a full-blown conversation at enterprise level. No, no disrespect to mid-market, but you need a more seasoned, I don't want to use the word mature, but experienced brain you know, at least a year yeah. to have that conversation. Um, Mid-market, SMB even, is a, you, you, you don't need to demand as much uh, experience or, you know, bullet points on a resume to put it in the team member into that segment. So after that, it's, it's mu much more organic of how they approach it. I like to offer up. So even today, I had a, had a call with a team member and he goes, James, I really love the fact that you've trained us in the onboarding we have a full month of zero targets and they get paid in full, but their job is to just absorb everything possible. Interesting. Shadow, meet with their sales reps, understand, watch the videos, full month. But it's a an investment in them so they can invest in themselves to hit the ground running. Month two is when they have their first month of targets. So uh, fast forward, we leave everything to them at that point. And, you know, raise your hand if you need help. But the number one relationship they, they need to focus on is their sales reps. They need to be, 
I always get made fun of because I'm a movie buff and you know growing up in Northern California with in the Star Wars world it's not Batman or Robin because one's a sidekick it's more like Han Solo Chewbacca they are partnering to save the galaxy right cheesy but it's universally understood so like case in point 2010 my sales rep in Detroit gets up on stage he goes I would not be up here if I didn't talk to James Barton seven days a week even to the point my wife calls in my work way. <laughs> so number one priority is the sales reps you're aligned to. Right. That's the number one relationship you need to make sure that's it's an ongoing, but two-way street. Got it. And so then that kind of naturally also accounts for swim lanes and maybe even geo or different ways that you can a- attack um, your ICP or, or your total addressable market. Yeah, and it, it's all organic. It starts foundationally being an organic thing. Back to the art form of sales and sales development, you put too much structure and don't allow creativity in that organic evolution. You, you start forcing people to do things that don't come naturally to them and they fail, right? Do you like, think that goes all the way across the board? I mean, one of the things that I've seen um, as a reason or a rationale for missing quota for underperformance is oftentimes too rigidly scripting or otherwise controlling activities um, on, on behalf of SDRs. I, I, I won't be 100% resounding yes, that is, but it can be a really big factor. Yeah. Um, like my, my first two months in 2006 as an SDR, I was aligned to a, uh, a few states on the East Coast and I was doing everything textbook you know, black and white, this is, you have to do a hundred phone calls a day. And I got to the point after two months, I'm like, this is, I'll be, I'll, I'll save my adult language, but this is baloney. Like <laughs> it does, it doesn't freaking matter how many phone calls I make. It doesn't matter how many conversations I have and how many relationships I can create and how much value I can bring to my sales reps. Yeah. I, I even, even today, like I don't, I don't look at that call metrics or emails more than maybe every week, once a week. Unless an SDR is, you know, destined for an improvement plan. Yeah. But I knew, I knew, and this is, you know, the, the operational side, which is nice because we rolled up through that um, was great first experience in sales development leadership at Success Factors. There's always a rhyme and reason, or like I know how many calls and emails or live conversations it takes to get a, a appointment on the board, meeting on the board. But it's how I get there and how I, you know, get creative. There, it's not linear. It's not, you know, point A, point B, point C. It's more like you get from point A to point G to point F to point L, whatever, right? And how do you communicate that then to, especially like say a new SDR, um, you know, someone with experience, someone like you're talking to me and I get it 100%, right? It's sure. as Stephen Covey once said, begin with the end in mind, right? Like the end is is kind of like, how do I open up sales conversations and forge that relationship so that they carry forward and I hit my quota and all that. And then I can do some backwards math on like, well, if my quota is X, I probably need to do Y amount of activities without being as linear and as kind of like structured as you're saying. But I think that a lot of times don't SDRs get lost at that point because they're not following the full math, the full picture, the full understanding. Um, so, so I've talked to a number of other SDR leaders that are like, nope, got to focus on activities <laughs> and, and help these guys along, you know? Yeah. Where do you yeah. fall? It sounds like you're a little bit more on the kind of the organic side of the, the fence here. Yes. Um, so two, three pieces of advice. One was actually direct advice uh, and two was more of an experience. Um, when I got into sales development leadership, my mom told me, she wanted to be the parent she never had. And I translated that to, I wanted to be the manager I never had. So it's an e- never, ever achievable goal. I've had some amazing leaders, like especially my, my leader back in IASD. He was still is an incredible guy, incredible leader, CEO of his great company. Um, but he, he, he lifted the bar that much further up, right? It wasn't just another step. It was probably like another 10 steps up, right? Yeah. So that was the first part. The, the second part was Michael Scott. And it's kind of cheesy, but it's true. He's, he once said on an episode of The Office, he invests in people because people do, don't go out of business. 
<laughs> it's true. I right? love that. And and back to the whole point of it being an art form, having a fine arts degree. Yeah. You know you cannot operationalize unless you're Andy Warhol, who once said, I'm not an artist, I'm a machine. Unless you're Andy Warhol, you cannot operationalize 100% of something that is truly at its core an art form. Mm. So I want, so to answer your question, I've been really fortunate and even current team, amazing. Like I'm still impressing me five days a week, blowing me out of the water of like what I used to do as an FDR. Team members, leaders, managers who I've worked with and to, to visually or audibly visually, if you want to say it, in Palo Alto two years ago, uh, the end of the year, I was presenting to the marketing department for the first time. Uh, it was like right after Thanksgiving. And my first slide after my title slide, my presentation, and I'm the last one to go the whole week, right? So everybody's just like, dude, I got a flight to catch. Come on, let's go, right? It is a... <laughs> But I, I put up my org chart, right? And I was one of the ask of my manager at the time. He said, yeah, put an org chart up. I'm like, great. And it goes up and I get a hand because all these people are like, huh? Huh? Like, you know, the RCA dog looking at the, the record player, right? Like, huh? Yeah. It was upside down. And people are like, hey, Barton, you're an idiot. Uh, I'm like, actually it was intentional because I back it up every day or try to, and I ask for feedback on how I can be better, but they don't work for me. I work for them. And if you say it, you talk the talk and you walk the walk behind that, it, it, it gives this extra kind of like, I don't know, X factor, turbo boost, empowerment, confidence, trust that it's, it's, I'll never ask them to trust me. Mm -hmm. I'll just never give, never give them a reason not to. Interesting. So over empowerment, like I give them a lot of rope, probably too much rope to all hang themselves with. I hate to use that term, but it's true, you know? Um, but it's produced some incredible, incredible professionals, let alone people. Yeah. Um, one of my first hires in 2015 at Mixed Panel was a JD MBA out of Stanford, finished second in his class. Still in touch with him today. And he looks at me and goes, James, you're the reason why I joined the company. I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude, shut up. You're far smarter than me. He goes, no, but like I knew coming in, you were going to give me the freedom to do my job and leave me alone. I'm like, yeah. He goes, and if I screw up, you come find me. I'm like, yeah, you don't need me bringing down your neck to do your job. Right. So yeah, it's, it's organic. It's relationship building. It's heart. It's trust. It's, you know, you, you're not answering to me. You're answering to your sales reps. Right. That's harder. And they're the hand that feeds you. So why would you want to bite it? Those are some deep insights. And I'm glad that you shared that. You know, the, the image that's coming to my mind is you referenced Star Wars earlier. And I'm I'm getting some definite like Obi-Wan or Yoda vibes here. <laughs> because the dynamic that's being created and what you've just laid out as a case for running an SDR team, that's not even the right way to describe it. For an SDR team that runs, you're you're now like effectively like um, not even the pace setter. <laughs> you know, sorry to mix metaphors there, but no, no, you're good. I, I, and I think that's kind of where I, I found I my not a, my comfort. It's not it's never comfortable because yeah. it's such a seasonal and moving target set. Sure. Um, and you got. I, I think that that. You got to show up every day, right? Like if, if your entire right. team was missing quota, like this wouldn't be a conversation. Totally. And and I put it this way, like I'm going on parental leave in two weeks from tomorrow, right? My first first baby, really excited about it. But I've committed to every single member of my team, not my boss, not my colleagues, not my, my CEO. If my team needs me, I'll answer the phone. Even a process like my the leadership teams has a document. They put all the asks in a document and every Tuesday, I'm gonna check it out for about half an hour to an hour. Because I told them, I'm committed, I'm in, like I've got nothing that's holding me back and I don't wanna hold back from making sure they're successful. So it's, it's, I think it's a rarer and rarer thing when it comes to sales or commission oriented roles. And I'm not trying to blow smoke at the people's rear ends that do this. Yeah. But you know, 
So one of the one-liners I got from my success factors days was the head of sales, Jay Larson, that took us public. And he goes, half of winning is showing up. But if you're showing up all the time, you're probably going to win more than half the time. Right. Right. What's, what's the famous quote? 80% of life is showing up, said somebody somewhere at some yeah. point. But, but that's true for everything. It's true for yeah. your love life, true for work, it's true for friendships, you know, like being dependable, being, you know, talented. and, you know, not trying to sell them timeshares or doing stupid <laughs> stuff that you just don't believe in. Like, that's sure it's great for some people, but I don't believe in that, right? Yeah. I believe in what I do. I believe in my team. I'm the representative of bringing them in and empowering them. So it's, you know, I want to make them as valuable and as successful as possible. Well, and more importantly, I think that at least some of the things that I've heard is that the structure plays a really important role in that. For instance, giving people a month to absorb, to sponge, um, you didn't use that word, but I did, uh, yeah. and figure things out to, to kind of realize that, hey, you know what, it's going to be up to me to produce results in this job. And this company is giving me kind of like the tools I need for me to kind of like self-select <laughs> into yeah. how to put put those numbers on the board. And I'm guessing that you yeah. probably run a lot of your own coaching and one-on-ones and and or team meetings where am I way off base in saying that they're probably a lot like therapy sessions. Hey, I'm trying this, this isn't working. Hey, I'm experimenting with this. Hey, I'm thinking about this in this way. Like yeah, and I and I think part of the investment of leadership is investing in the person, getting to know them. Not, you know, you don't need to know like their waist size and you know what they're allergic <laughs> to, but like, you know, getting to know them, their their goals or you know, career path advancement or wherever they want to go in life. Because they may not know everything that's out there. I didn't know anything when I right. first became a sales development rep. So part of it is being a cheerleader, a coach, a mentor. A, 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 something to lean on, somebody to vent to. Um, I've got a team member on my team that's really frustrated with what's going on. And I thought he was like a level of six out of 10 frustration. He's like a nine out of 10, he's breaking down. And I'm like, okay, all the BS aside, what's up, man? I made a two hour call. And not because I wanted to stay on a call for two hours with the guy, but you know, he's an amazing human being, let alone a team member. And we got done and he's like, do you want to talk about like work stuff? I'm like, yeah, we can talk about it next week. It's middle of the month. Who cares? Right. This is more important. And I think that is something that, you know, a lot of my team members have told me over the years is like, you, you're it's kind of like John Wooden. Yeah. Is wisdom, not what dash wise, but like, it's just fundamentally what's most, most important in life. You know, yeah. it's, you, your ham, your family, your health, your well-being, your happiness, your comfort, and then everything else is just the small stuff below it. The wooden pyramid of success is definitely uh, it's on my wall, uh, <laughs> and I highly recommend it to others because it is about doing a lot of the basics right to get to yeah. you know ultimately the top rung, which in in his world was competitive greatness. Um, yeah, and and the the pathway to le the leadership in sales development world isn't a guaranteed path of success. You're not going to be the first 10 employees. You're not going to even be in round B funding, right? right? But you can have the most amount of impact as an SDR leader equal to everybody else in, in, in even executive level, you know? Like, I, I, again, I'm giving full credit to my team. Yeah, but in the six first six months um, from July through December of 2021, as at Venify, we were voted the most improved team of the co company of that year. And then month after month, quarter after quarter, again, my team, not me, hitting all time highs, record highs. I've had people that have been working at Venify for six, seven, eight, 12, 13 years going, we've never seen anything like this. And I'm like, don't talk to me. Tell my team. They're the ones who are doing this, man. And I'm just, you know, bottom up, like I, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the upside down pyramid, right? For the yeah. one chart. So yeah, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun and it's inspiring too. It makes me want to work harder. I can tell it just oozes across. And, and I think that everyone listening to this is going to kind of be nodding Ed in violent agreement that you seem like the exact embodiment of what you said earlier, which is 
being kind of that manager, being that kind of leader that, that you never had, or that you would wish you worked for, right? Like, cause all these goals are, it's like pay it forward type stuff. It really is. But it's, it's, it's also a sales development tends to be kind of, again, oh, sales development. Yeah. You'll, we'll, we'll let you talk in a second or like, oh yeah, we'll get to you. You know, it's like Matt Damon on the Jimmy Kimmel show. Um, but the, 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 you have somebody who's been doing it a long time, who knows what they're talking about, can actually speak the languages of different departments as well. I think that's really the, the surprise for me mm-hmm. in my, but in June, I'll be starting my 18th year of doing this. Wow. And um, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing way of being able to translate. Like you can't just do that to an SDR. So I've got a new boss who started at the beginning of this year. We have all these great campaigns going, but they're, as I call them, slow burns, right? They don't just start. You got to build up the momentum. You got to prepare. And because of this other campaigns that are still rolling from the past, it takes an extra week or two, whatever, to start them going because there's delay or things need to finish first, right? Yeah. So she's like, why aren't, why aren't the team members jumping on it? I'm like, they are. It, it's it, they just need to wrap up what was at last act of them last year to get the ball rolling. There's a lot of changes happened at the start of the year. New model for us, new model for sales, realignment of the, the sales organization, marketing organization. So it, it, part of it is just like, hey, time out. Let's realize what's going on here. And being just the, the, the advocate for the team, be like, they're kicking butt. They're slaving at their jobs. You can't expect that, that we are about as agile as a, you know, cruise ship in Nor- Norwegian Fjord. Like it doesn't turn on the dime. <laughs> but that, but that's also a mirror of the market we we call into. Yeah. Cybersecurity doesn't, unless it's reactive because something bad happened. They're not, you know, as as fast as sales and marketing organizations are. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just part of it is just an organic path. I learn as much from my team as they do from me. I probably learn more. And one of the things that I asked recently that people are actually surprised to hear me ask, and I've had to change it different ways, is how am I doing? Yeah. Because I firmly believe the only way you get better is by failing or getting feedback. I don't want to fail. Rather get feedback. I mean, tell me I'm ugly. Tell me I smell funny. (laughs) <laughs> or look like I smell funny, I should say, since it's all over Zoom these days. But like leaders need to actually stop and listen to their team more. Yeah, I think that's yeah. sage advice right there. You know, because we get stuck. Yeah, good. Sorry. I was just going to say, like, you're on the front lines. I mean, that's another aspect of the SDR role that I think is super critical is the learnings that you get from direct response are just that direct response (laughs) from your would be customers. um, You can learn all kinds of things uh, if you're paying attention and listening. Yeah, totally agree. And I kept going, I kept asking the question and I learned another lesson from a former team member, last company. I'm like, how am I doing? And she goes, great. And I'm like, okay, that's not a good way of asking the question. How do I ask that question? She goes, what are you known for? And I'm like, okay, what am I known for? She goes, getting SHID done and being the bad guy so we can be the good guys. And I'm like, sweet. Where can I do more of that? And where can I improve? And she's like, just keep doing it because everybody relies on you to be that guy. I'm like, cool, done. There you go. I'm curious, um, slight segue, maybe not. For someone that's led kind of SDR teams dealing with such different kind of ideal customer profiles Mm. from the HR leader at SuccessFactor to now, you know, the cybersecurity kind of like suite, if you will, or dare I say the CIO suite um, of a company and a bunch of stops in between. You know, I'm thinking of when you're at Mixpanel dealing with product marketing and marketers. um, Talk to me about learning your personas and really building programs around those relationships because the people you're talking to, I think we can all agree that like a, a CHRO and a CIO are not the same people and not even remotely close. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's it's kind of the way I see it. It's two different areas. Yeah. So those of us who've been in sales um, in sales oriented roles, we've been asked to read a lot of boring books. A lot of books are probably are better used as a doorstop in my house than actually me reading them. <laughs> One of which it's actually two books now, but the Challenger Sale and Challenger Customer. Like eighty percent of it is out of date. Completely irrelevant now, and kind of makes you feel like a, I don't know, a really s- smarmy salesperson when you're reading it. I'm like I don't want to be that person, you know. But foundationally, especially the Challenger customer version, it identifies the personas, not the titles, not the pains and needs. Not any, but you know, there's an executive person, there's a cheerleader. I'm, I'm using my own words, but there's executive decision maker, the check signer cheerleader, the end user, the advocates, uh, maybe even formal relationships we've had in the past from being previous customers. Foundationally, those basically don't change in any industry you look at in technology. The layer on top of it, or the, the frosting on top of that cupcake, is the uniqueness of each one of the roles you're calling into. That's where you need to, like I, and we rely upon our product marketing team, uh, sales enablement when possible, but also because I've been around a long time, I've got a lot of connections, which I've, I'm discovering more and more. I'm like, wow, you were just some jack wagon at the first company I worked for. Now you're a CISO. Oh, can we talk? You know, like <laughs> cashing in those personal favorites. I, all, all kidding aside, this guy that I just would nerd out with about Star Wars stuff at Success Factors turns out to be a CISO at a venture capital firm. I'm like, hey, can I? bribe you with some good wine and come talk to my team for half an hour. And they can teach things to my team that no one in my company can ever teach because I don't know. Yeah. Right. Or this, or the CISOs or the, the target audience we're going after is either being like, you know, here are the questions ahead of time that we want you to prepare for, but they never have anything to do with the front side of the sales cycle, the prospecting side. What makes them be like, oh, yeah, reply or answer the phone. I'm like, yeah, I'll take 20 minutes out of my day. They, they never have anything to do with that. Never. Never. Never, ever. You never hear of a customer going, hey, this great guy named James Barton called me out of the blue on the Thursday at 4 p.m. And I, what he was saying, I couldn't put the phone down. Like, you never hear that. Right? <laughs> so true. Never, ever. So true. Right? It's more like I got this annoying schmuck that keeps calling me be like, what? Yeah. And I finally gave up and took the call. And oh, it turns out it aligns with the project we have done. So, like again, it's always an afterthought. It's never, you know, the SDR. So I always encourage team members, and this is true even to today. Ask if you can, ask your prospect why they agreed to the meeting after the meeting. Get the credit first. Get the credit, right? And that's something I did back in 2008 when I was in sales for a success factors, doing my own prospecting still, didn't have an SDR. I, another story for one day, I did a fax campaign. Amazing. Yeah. I'll tell you that later. Um, <laughs> Completely useless I, for going forward, but hey, badge but, of honor. But, well, let's, you know, let's face it, all, health, all healthcare, all finance companies, all still have fax numbers. That is true. Insurance, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm learning that more and more. Having a pregnant wife and get a fax in, you know, to receipts to get reimbursed to your <laughs> flexible spending and all that stuff. But, um, but the, the the point is, is that you know, you, you I don't know. I, I, I can ramble on about this for a long period of time, but hopefully well, that I, makes. I like that bit of advice. Why did you agree to take this meeting? And you know, funny enough, breaking the third wall—that's something that we at Science do all the time. Um, and, and it is very meta, right? Like an outsourced, you know, sales development firm <laughs> that sets meetings yeah. for itself, inbound or outbound, yeah. can ask that question all day long because we know, A, we're on stage, we're being judged, you know, like it matters why you took a meeting with us because you're, you're thinking like, hey, if you hire us, this is what I'm going to get. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, but it's, it's setting, it's setting expectations, right? It's the same thing. Like even where I've gotten to the point, it's a long story, make it short and sweet. When I was in sales, I would ask the customer why they signed with us. Yeah. 
or you're, you're starting that question that will eventually, for the majority of sales development reps who want to go into sales, it's going to be asked of them when they get to sales. Why are you asking me to do a forecast when I have an SDR? Guess what? It's going to happen when your next job. That's right. So it's just, you know, constant improvement, as Thomas Keller likes to say, the famous chef. Yeah. Let's French be a laundry. little bit better than yesterday. What's that? French Laundry. You got it. He's the only American chef that has multiple three-star Michelin restaurants. Amazing. Yeah. And he was the uh, consulting chef for Guide and Suey, too. Fun fact. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Great movie. But he has this famous saying, let's be a little bit better than yesterday. That's it. Yeah. Like kind of the 1% rule, right? Like 1% right. is a reasonable goal to shoot for day in and day out. And then compound, you know, interest or compound returns really helps yeah. improve your lot. And, and a lot of these fundamentals, and the last thing I'll say, but, and I'm talking a lot, but um, the, the, a lot of these fundamentals and lessons I learned were from the CEO of Success Factors, Lars Dahlberg. He, he was weird and crazy, but amazing and inspiring and passionate. And they'd be like, extra 10 push-ups, James. Today at the gym and tomorrow at the gym and did extra 10 push-ups. And I'm like, okay. Sure enough, the lesson that I learned, especially my mom got sick and unfortunately died in brain cancer, an extra 10 minutes, an extra 10 hours, an extra day, it all adds up over time. If you do all that, you've got an extra, you know, 3,650 push-ups every year. It's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. So. Can also extend to that extra call being made, that extra email, that extra LinkedIn, you know, connection request out the door. You know, yeah. when I was calling into Detroit in 2009, I would make a lot of my phone calls on Fridays at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Michigan yeah. time. Yeah. And executives would be like, hello. I'm like, oh, no gatekeeper. You know, golden hours. All of a sudden, I know exactly. I know you're on your way out, but who do I talk to on Monday? Never <laughs> asked for the appointment with execs. I never did. Yeah. Never needed to. But yeah, that was it. Good pieces of advice. James, this has been great. I mean, you've laid out a case, very charismatic, very persuasive. Um, for th those in the audience that may want to pick up the conversation and have it with you directly, learn more about you, your team, <coughs> your company, uh, where should they go? Uh, best way is just go on LinkedIn. Um, I think it's just JB Barton is my, my handle on LinkedIn. Um, it's discoverable. It's there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's best way especially because I'm about to go on parental leave. I'm probably not going to be that responsive, but I definitely, any message that's sent my way, I always respond. So that's fine. Maybe we'll even, uh, you know, podcasts have this weird evergreen factor to them where people listen to them and, you know, even a year down the line, it's like uh, nothing we talked about here won't be relevant <laughs> in 2025. Sure. Sure. I'm, I'm watching LinkedIn learning videos right now from 2019. They're great. Right? As long as they're not about AI, everything's good. <laughs> yeah don't steal our That's jobs even faster than we have the time to capture right now but it, it is interesting you know it's a whole different subject that people are like in, in sales development they're so scared of and i'm like you can't take the personal factor out and and out of that there is none yeah you know i agree i agree well here's to building that revenue predictability engine um thank you for gracing us with your presence your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been fun.